to this webinar to risk-based investigation. So I've had a lot of good discussions with several people joining in today about the what's the intent of characterization in the first place and how to tie risk in. Yeah. We we're setting things up. Yeah, so a few people remember to mute your phone when you're joining in. Uh, this uh, webinar will be recorded and the final slides posted to our web page. I'm still making some small edits to the slides. This will be posted, should be by the early next week. Dene, welcome. Uh, Aloha, and we have a great group of people joining in today. Probably, I'm guessing, around 150 people from about 25 different states in the U.S. Also, some people joining in from Mexico, Australia, and a special aloha to the Environmental Office of the Quapaw Nation. I think they're joining in from Oklahoma. It'd be great to have everyone in the, the same room. Now, actually, I think we should do this at a Patel conference in two years, set up a special session on ball tanker sampling. Also, aloha to several people from US EPA headquarters and the regional offices joining in. So one of my favorite movies is The Matrix, and I won't read the, the quote here from Morpheus, but I've started in this business, or this work out 25 years ago, and there's always something in the back of my mind and a lot of people's mind about how we're collecting samples or are they representative. We just never took the time to stop and think about it. That's something we're gonna be focusing on today, especially how we can incorporate the idea of risk into site characterization. We've always had risk-based corrective action. We've never really thought about that as far as how we're designing the sample collection to begin with. <clears throat> a few quick references, and there's several, but just to focus on these published by our office, the Technical Guidance Manual describes how decision unit multi-increment sampling investigation methods are, are carried out in the field in the theoretical background. Also, we have a document titled Evaluation of Environmental Hazards at Sites with Contaminated Soil and Groundwater. This is our risk assessment guidance where we special focus on environmental screening levels or action levels. And I'll briefly mention that today. Also, have a six-part webinar series that we carried out in 2017. It's posted to our office's YouTube channel. So these are the key topics with decision and multi increment sampling methods. And there's about an hour or longer recorded webinar for each one of the topics on how to set up a site investigation, how to designate decision units, areas where you're going to collect samples in the field, how to characterize these areas once you've designated them based on G sampling theory and differences between discrete sampling methods and multi increment sampling methods. Also, how you carry this out in the field, how do you actually physically clear a site and collect samples. A lot of details down to which tools to use for gravelly soil versus soft soils, how to do surface sample sampling versus subsurface sampling, how pro samples should be processed in the laboratory, and then a last session on environmental hazard evaluation, how to tie in the concept of hazard or environmental risk into your sample design. Yeah. These are available on our webinar, on our web page. You can see at the bottom is the link. I think if you just go to Google and type in here, Hawaii here, H-E-E-R, webinars, you should find the web page or do the same thing in YouTube and you'll find it. That's also the guidance, is both guidance documents are being translated into Chinese and uh, one series of webinars actually has Chinese subtitles. So anyone interested in working to translate our guidance, let us know. We've talked to people about translating it into Russian, Spanish, and even Arabic. For the Chinese version, we should have that up and running mm -hmm. by the end of the year. Webinar topics, I'll be going more or less in this order, go over some quick terminology, risk assessment, basics, it's something I haven't really focused on in past webinars. We're looking especially at the origin of discrete soil sampling methods in the 1980s, a field study of discrete sample data reliability that we carried out a couple of years ago using grant funds from US EPA. Then we'll uh, get into discussing decision units, multi increment sample site investigation methods, over a quick case study at the end, and then a brief discussion of how our office made the trans, uh, transition from discrete sampling and methods to DUMIS, as we call it, beginning about 10 years ago now. So I like this quote from Albert Einstein, if I had one hour to solve the problems of the world, I would spend 59 minutes on explaining the problem and one minute on explaining the answer. We're not going to quite go to that extreme today, but I am going to focus a lot on discrete soil sampling methods and why they aren't reliable and why the transition to UMIS is needed. This can be really frustrating 
to people who are just getting started in this or have only been in the environmental industry business for a year or so, and they have been in, indoctrinated into collecting discrete samples. Like, I always get asked in our workshops, why are you spending so much time talking about something so obvious? But it's important if you understand this is what we were doing in the U.S. and re really around the world for the last 30 years. It's something we have to deal with. Quick notes on terminology. First, what's a decision unit? I'll be using this term quite a bit during the webinar or DU. A decision unit, best way to think of it, it's an area or volume of soil you would collect and test as a single mass, as a single sample, if you could. Maybe it's your front yard or maybe some spilled area. You'd like to send it all to lab as one sample, but you can't, so you have to collect a representative sample. Now, a discrete sample, this was uh, started in, by the US EPA in the 1980s. It's a sample collected from a single point within a targeted area. You can think of this as a single increment sample. The mass that you collect is usually based on what the laboratory needs, typically one to 200 grams. A multi-increment sample, in contrast, a relatively new idea in the environmental industry. They've been using this approach in the agriculture and mining mineral exploration business for decades. And a multi-increment sample, it's a sample, single sample collected from multiple points, each point we call an increment, within the targeted area. So the mass and the number of increments included in the sample are based on G sampling theory, and we'll look at that a little bit later on. Again, it's still just a single sample from one area. A discrete sample is intended to represent the area around it. How big of an area? That's a good question. A composite sample, this is something we've had a lot of discussions about, but if you go back to the original term using EPA guidance in the 1980s, early 1990s, a it originally meant that uh, these are samples collected from separate areas where decisions to be made on each different area, but they're combined into one bulk sample for testing at the laboratory or composited in order to save on laboratory cost. Uh, the problem with this approach is that you could potentially underrepresent higher concentration areas in your composite data, in your composite sample. So therefore, if, under TOSCA and other regulations, if you collect a composite sample, you have to multiply your data results by the number of areas, D, DU areas or discrete samples included in the composite sample for comparison to clean up levels. Something. That's the original intent of a composite sample. This, now the, the way it's described in some of the reports, it sounds just like a multi-increment sample or an ISM sample but it's used differently in different reports. So you can, in theory, you could composite multi-increment samples. And here we've got four multi-increment samples collected from the same area. Each sample is collected from lots of different points. But you could composite them and go through the same process at the laboratory. But in reality, you would never do this. And this key point here is a multi-increment sample is not a composite sample under TOSC and other EPA regulations. Compositing of multi-increment samples is not allowed, definitely under our guidance. It would be a waste of time to do this after you spend all the time collecting it. We really recommend you avoid the use of the term composite in any reports, unless you happen to be dealing with a, a regulator who's been trained in this and understands it. But otherwise, it can cause you a lot of problems. A few notes on risk assessment basics. So what we deal with in the environmental industry most of the time, and we'll talk about acute risk later, but we're looking at long-term exposure to low, relatively low concentrations of contaminants, referred to as chronic risk. To assess this, the risk is based on the average daily exposure over this entire well exposure done. period. So in this case, we might be looking at contaminants in air, in soil, and groundwater. It could be in fruit or anything. But a key objective is to collect a representative, to collect a sample that's representative of your ex assumed exposure. The only people who have been doing this semi-correctly in the past 20 or 30 years of the people collecting air samples. They would never go into a room or a building and open up a four-ounce jar, collect an air sample, close it real tightly, and send it back to the laboratory. That's not representative exposure. They would go into a, a room or a building with a suma canister and open it up and allow it to draw a sample over, say, a 24-hour period. So in the end, they're sending a small volume, one or six liters, to the laboratory, but that small volume air sample represents a huge volume of air that was flowing through that building in the end. That's the way you do a risk-based characterization for air. That's what DUMIS is intended to do for soil. So you can have lots of different potential concerns, direct exposure, ecotoxicity, leaching, vapor intrusion, gross contamination. It depends on your site. So let's look at how chronic risk is assessed. It's really fairly simple. It's a sim very simplified risk equation. It's your cancer or non-cancer risk 
the 10 in a million risk, 1 in a million risk, or non-cancer hazard quotients. It's equal to your average exposure concentration in whatever media you're looking at times a bunch of exposure factors, how many, how many milligrams of soil is my child eating a day, how much air am I inhaling, such times the toxicity factor. Here's a quote from 1992 US EPA guidance. The concentration term in the chronic risk intake equation is an estimate of the arithmetic average concentration for a contaminant in a defined exposure area based on a set of sampling results. So again, we're looking at an average. We can rearrange this equation and calculate risk-based screening levels. This was a huge step forward in the, in the 1990s. So risk-based screening levels equal, again, this is a simplified equation to some acceptable risk, cancer risk, non-cancer risk, divided by a bunch of exposure factors, again, times the toxicity. So the, the risk-based screening levels you can think of, whether ours, US EPA's, it's the allowable average concentration of a contaminant in the media for a targeted area and volume, in this case of soil. Again, this was a key part of risk-based corrective action in the 1990s. Significantly expedited risk assessment process. In the past, it used to take at least a year to do a risk assessment. Now we can do it. We can at least screen the data very quickly. The problem is we've never had guidance on how to do a risk-based site characterization to compare to the data to, with the risk-based corrective action. That's the whole issue we've been thinking about in Hawaii for the last 10 or 15 years now. How do we incorporate the concept of risk into site investigations? We've been doing this in part where look at the questions we have listed here. You know, what are the primary environmental concerns at a site? Direct exposure, leaching, vapor intrusion, short-term risk and gross contamination, whatever. And what are the site investigation objectives? What are your data quality objectives or DQOs? It might be, does uh, arsenic in my backyard pose a potential risk to my child or something like that? That's, we have this, this uh, part down, Pat pretty well in the 1990s. The problem is this step number three, what data resolution is needed to meet the site investigation objectives? This is where the risk assessors come in. Are we concerned about the concentration of arsenic in every spot in our backyard or in a park? Or how about each playground in a huge park or the entire park? But it depends on your question and on the site. It's something you have to work out with the risk assessors ahead of time. So ideally, risk as well as potential remediation questions uh, and needs need to be considered up front in the site characterization to design. That's an important point. The risk assessors and remediation people should have always been in, involved in the initial sample collection of the site. In reality, the risk assessors, as I was when I was consulted, my background is a geologist, but I also do risk assessment. But the risk assessors and remediation specialists often just get stuck with inadequate after-the-fact data, and there's no time or money to collect additional samples. So you have to deal with what you have. So. Now, this gets back to the point of collecting representative samples, you know, the representative of exposure in our in the risk. So the first question to think about is, are discrete soil samples representative? And I collected discrete soil samples and made lots of decisions on them for the first 10 years of my career. Again, we always had this burning question in our minds. Are they representative? Two key assumptions in the early guidance for the use of discrete samples, which are only used in the environmental industry. The, the level is assumed to be uniform within a contaminated area and zero outside of it. This is in the PCB spill cleanup guidance. So if you have a spill of PCBs onto the ground, oils, you could test a spot of soil anywhere within that area, and you're going to get more or less the same concentration. This is a key assumption in the use of discrete soil samples. 1989 guidance methods for evaluating the attainment of cleanup standards, when there is little distance between points, is expected that there will be little variability between points. So again, this concept or assumption of uniformity. And if this was true, then uh, a few samples collected from single points across a site under an investigation would be adequate to characterize contamination and assess risk at the site, as long as it was this uniform. So this really expedited things. It allowed direct comparison of individual discrete samples to risk-based screening levels. Well, here's what Dr. Phil might say, how's that working for you? And this is something I certainly dealt with in the early part of my career, need for multiple remobilizations and step-out investigations when you're doing discrete samples. So this is why uh, site investigations using discrete samples can be drawn out for years. You see highly variable data, failed confirmation samples, or 
are very common using discrete sampling approaches where you start off with what you think is a small area of contamination for excavation removal. It keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger as your confirmation samples fail or it starts to seem really random. Guess what it is? Or the worst case, remediated sites are later found to still be contaminated. That's the worst case scenario, which is starting to happen as we go back and reinvestigate some of the sites we closed and we thought we cleaned up in the early 1990s. So ever wonder, what if I move my sample point over a few, a few feet collecting discrete samples? We certainly thought of that. So, or what if the lab tested a different aliquot of soil when it opened up my four ounce jar? Then would they get the same answer? And this is something I'd never thought about before, how much mass a laboratory tests for metals. It's typically just half a gram to one gram. That's a pinch. VOCs, five grams, that would fit in the top of a typical soda bottle cap. PCBs, pesticides, TPH, PHs, 10 to 30 grams. Again, very tiny mass, maybe a little spoonful. Another key point that someone in the laboratory pointed out to me years ago, soil samples can't be reliably homogenized to the scale of a laboratory subsample to where every gram or every even 30 grams within that sample, you're going to get the same number. So when you see that homogenized sticker on top of your discrete sample jar, really call it into question because it, it's impossible to do. As one person in the laboratory told me, try sticking a metal rod into a jar full of dirt and stirring it. You might be able to homogenize it a little bit, but you, it could also cause all the fines to go to the bottom where the contamination is. So discrete sample data can only be assumed to represent the actual mass of soil tested. That's a key point. Well, we wondered about all this, too. So there's some separate webinars posted on this study. A few years ago, we used our grant money from US EPA to carry out a field study of discrete sample variability. We went to three known contaminated sites, already fairly well studied with discrete sample data. At each one of these sites, we set 24 grid points. At each one of the grid points and across the site in general, we collected hundreds of side-by-side -side discrete samples. And site, study site A was a site contaminated with arsenic from wastewater discharge onto fine grain soils. We expected, and we could see in discrete sample data, see lower variability here. Study site B was a site contaminated with lead from incinerator ash mixed with fill material. Study site C was a site contaminated with PCBs from dumping of transfer war and other electrical equipment oil. We saw a huge variability in, in uh, discrete samples from study site C. We weren't sure about study site B with the incinerator ash. We thought it would be in between low variability arsenic, high variability for PCBs. We wanted to look at two things. One was the evaluation of what we call intra-sample variability. This is where the lab gets a sample and plucks out a gram or a spoonful of soil to test independently. What's the variability of concentration within a single sample? So for the two sites where we were looking at lead and arsenic, we collected a sample as undisturbed as possible, and then used a portable XRF to test each sample 10 times and look at variability within a single sample. For the PCBs at that site, each one of the 24 grid points, we collected what would have been a single discrete sample, but we broke it up and put it into 10 small jars and had the lab test each jar. So we're getting 10 data points for each sample. We also want to look at the variability between co-located samples. We refer to this as inter-sample variability. In this case, at each one of the same grid points, we collected five co-located discrete samples. Each one of these samples we processed using MIS or ISM methods, which we'll talk about later with samples were dry, sieved, and carefully subsampled. So we get what should be fairly represented data for each one of our co-located samples. We click the variability between co-located samples. Field study, these are, we published this in a paper in 2017, a two-part paper, a critical review of discrete soil sample reliability, part one, field study results, part two, and implications. We're gonna go over here in a minute. These were published in the journal Soil and Sediment Contamination. It's also a 2015 field report published to our webpage and recorded webinars are posted to our uh, YouTube webpage. Here's what we found. Here's the low interest sample variability at the arsenic site. So this representative of any single sample, say a laboratory gets a sample and tests it multiple times, this is what they might find. Uh, concentration ranging between, in this example, 141 ppm to 204 ppm is the highest. So again, variability within a single sample. Average variability about 1.5 times between the maximum concentration reported and the minimum concentration reported. This is the inter-sample variability between co-located samples. So in this case, this is real data, so 
the lowest concentration, 120 ppm arsenic in the soil, and just a, a foot away, three feet away, 260 ppm. Average variability, very similar to what we saw within the samples. There's something to this. It'd be fun to look into in more detail. This is, this is completely random. It doesn't mean arsenic concentrations are increasing in the direction from 120 to 260. If you went a foot away from the 260, you might find 130 or something else. This is low variability, which is a shock to a lot of my risk assessor friends. Moderate variability, this is the lead study site. It's interesting, it came out pretty much as we had predicted. The average variability within a single sample from our lead study site was about fourfold. So in this example, we see the lowest concentration, 176 ppm, highest concentration was looks like 269 ppm. So this is actually less than typical. This was interesting. Hawaii's environmental action level or screening level for lead in soil at residential sites just coincidentally is 200 ppm. Almost every single sample we tested multiple times, we could find a concentration of lead below and above 200 ppm. So start thinking about the implications for that. And some samples that vary by more than order magnitude. Here's the inter sample variability, co located samples at lead contaminated site. Again, we saw that the same thing. The low concentration here, 120 ppm, a, a foot or two away, 300 ppm. So above and below, coincidentally, our action level. Again, average variability between co-located samples, about twofold. But it was up to almost order magnitude in some places. Here's our PCB site. The PCBs have been such a hassle to deal with for the last 25 years I've been doing this. The discrete sample data just all over, even co-located, we knew. The, this here's another test of a single sample tested. You're broken up into 10 parts. Each part tested 10 different tests. Lowest concentration, 800 ppm. Highest concentration in the same, same sample, 5,700 ppm. An important note is we saw the same magnitude of variability in low concentrations where the samples were barely impacted. So this could have been PPB, part per billion, or PPM. We still see the same wide variability. Average concentration for this particular sample, 2,400 ppm. Here's the variability within at the same site but between co-located samples. It's one example. Again, these are all processed, so the data should represent the sample, discrete sample. So 4.9 ppm on one discrete sample, a foot or two away, 91 ppm. Again, this is completely random. It's not increasing toward the bottom right. Here's this six sample that we tested multiple times, the average 2,400 ppm, right beside the 4.9 ppm. It's a true hot spot. It is a spot. It's only maybe a, a foot across if the size where we collected the sample. Average variability between co-located samples at the PCB site, similar to what we saw within uh, in trust sample variability, over an order of magnitude. So what's going on there with the PCB site? We actually bought a microscope and want to look at this soil in detail. If you focus in, then if, you know, on the bottom right, you see the soil sample itself. We notice these small nuggets or small clumps of soil that were easily broken if you push them. The rest of the dark stuff here are lithic fragments of rock. We focused in even closer, and in the upper left-hand corner, what we discovered were, was in this soil, what we are pretty sure are PCB-infused tar balls. See, there's a lot of, this causes really high distributional heterogeneity within the soil. So these tar balls, you can try this at home, get some olive oil and pour it on, pour it on dry uh, flour, and you'll see the oil will beat up and then sink into the flour. And this is going to cause all these little balls and nuggets and clumps of, of olive oil infused flour in that case. So think about this. And a, a key point here and a kind of bit of enlightenment we had is the reported concentration you get from the laboratory, it varies with the mass or the volume of soil tested. If you were to test the bottom right-hand corner, all this soil together, then you might get a concentration of PCBs in the tens of ppm. If you actually test one of these single nuggets, or these single tar balls of PCBs, you might get thousands or hundreds of ppm PCBs. If you could zoom in with some special electron microprobe and test the matrix within one of these tar balls and get down to a tiny particle, at some point you're going to find 100% PCBs in the sample. So this, this whole the myth of maximum concentrations, contaminant concentrations of soil that I always looked for when I was an early consultant, 
is, is actually pretty easy to solve. If the contaminant is present, then at some scale, then the maximum concentration is going to be 100 percent. If it's not in the soil, it's 0 percent. So that question is quickly answered. There's your maximum concentration of contaminant in the soil. You have two choices, 0 or 100. So again, the back to the risk-based objective, this is why we always want to find out what the true concentration or mean concentration of the contaminant is for a specified sample area or volume of soil. This is a slide from ITRC's document we published in 2012. I know there's a large group from ITRC updating the incremental sampling methodology document online now. This is from our actual our arsenic site. You can see the same thing in the soil from our arsenic site. If you zoom in close enough, this was an electron microprobe, you'll see these little nuggets of iron hydroxides that are coated with arsenic. If you tested the soil, you're going to get one number. If you tested one of these iron nuggets, you're going to get another concentration of arsenic. If you just test the coating on these iron hydroxides, you're going to get 100% arsenic. Same concept. So the conclusion is, and this, is, again, it can be a, a shock to a lot of us that were doing discrete sampling for years of our career. Discrete sample data are, are completely random within an unknown range. I say largely now because now we're getting a better handle on it. The arsenic side, if you look, combine the variability within samples and between our co-located samples, and this is just in general, we see a variability of discrete samples around any given point of about twofold. That's a big deal for risk assessors, maybe not for site investigation. A lead contaminated site, average variability of discrete samples around single grid point sevenfold. PCB contaminated site, average variability, variability co-located samples 39-fold, well over an order of magnitude. So start thinking about the implications of this. There's another great quote from uh, The Matrix. You take the red pill, which you already have because you've already joined the webinar. You stay in Wonderland and find out how deep the rabbit hole goes. So we're going to do that. One thing with the ITRC guidance we published in 2012, we started in 2010. At that time, I think there were 100 people on the team. Only five or six of us had any actual experience or training in sampling theory and G-sampling theory and experience in the field. So. We like to joke within our office, and we all went through this. Those of us were doing discrete samples for years. You go through the five stages of grief, denial, angle, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. And ITRC guidance in 2012, we pretty much worked up to the bargaining stage. Well, the idea was, well, discrete samples are good in some cases. multi increment samples or ISM samples are good in others. In reality, that's not true. The, the whole point of ISM and G-sampling theory is to replace discrete soil sampling approaches as much more reliable. So hopefully in this next update, we'll work through this. We'll get through the depression stage, and then we'll have a party in to the acceptance stage. But again, for new people joining and just getting started in this kind of work, it's a, it's a big shock to find out that all the sites we worked on for the last 10 or 20 years of our career, that the data weren't quite as reliable as we think they were. In the end, they, it worked fairly well. It was just highly inefficient. So this is where the cause of all the problems we've been having with discrete soil samples. This is why we get failed confirmation samples, need for repeat investigations, no clear endpoint. It's a, a great way to create a brownfield that the client just runs out of money in the, with no clear endpoint to the investigation or in risk assessment. In this example here, we've done some initial discrete samples testing. I've done this plenty of times in my early career. Excavated contaminated soil. Then you collect confirmation samples where before you had clean and all of a sudden the confirmation samples are contaminated. Well, what's going on? It, we just didn't understand that at the time. It's all this small-scale heterogeneity. Now, also, a key point here of discrete samples, you find these odd, isolated hot spots and cold spots, and you dig them out, and you keep digging and digging, or maybe you think you're done just in one quick dig. So the problem here is the lab data aren't very reliably representative of the sample that was submitted. The sample we collected, not reliably representative of the area where it was collected from. This problem can't be fixed by collecting more and more discrete samples. You just dig yourself deeper in the rabbit hole, and it can't be fixed by statistical evaluation of discrete sample data. It can help you, but it's not going to fix the problem. This is a, some real data from our lead-contaminated site. Imagine if eight different people went out to the same site and collected sets of discrete samples from the exact same grid points. Would they get the same answer? But not at all. In this case, remember, at each grid point, we've estimated the range of the concentration of lead for discrete samples collected around each individual grid point. So grid point 21, we expect a range of between 103 ppm and 419 ppm. So at each one of these grid points, we had Excel pick a, a random concentration within the range for that grid point. You see it all plotted here. And then we made a map of the lead concentrations. So purple, really hot, red, hot, 200, yellow is over 200, 
milligram per kilogram screening level green is clean. So you get this pattern. You might think, oh, we have a hot spot here on the right, hot area here on the lower left, and then these odd hot spot out by itself in the upper left-hand corner. But here's the second person goes out and does the same thing. Well, guess what? They collect a sample at this same grid point 21 instead of 165 ppm. They get 401 ppm. You would never know this because no one ever goes out and collects replicate samples, sets of samples, discrete investigations. They get a similar pattern where it looks a lot more complicated or contaminated now, but you notice the hot spots are in the different place. Here's the third person comes along and fourth person collects samples at the same place. Here's the data they get. And again, this is fairly real data. You see your hot areas are moving around. So again, it's completely random. Here's the next four people do the same thing. This is another moment of enlightenment for us is these these really small scale hot spots and cold spots based on discrete data are completely artificial. It's you could call it fake data. That's why we we're so confused with this. This which of the lead patterns there are real in this particular case? Well, none of them, none of them are. This site was actually part of a 10 acre site that's all heavily contaminated with lead. If we'd started off collecting discrete samples in this little spot where we did our study, we'd hit a false negative pretty quickly. We'd get a number below 200 ppm, 50 50 chance. It's unavoidable premature termination of site investigation. And again, we start excavating the site, we'd get failed confirmation samples and probably potentially a premature termination of the entire cleanup effort. We thought we cleaned up the site, but in reality, we missed a lot of contamination. Now, large scale patterns can be real identified by, you know, with discrete samples if you have a large grid. This is an example of an arsenic contaminated site, nine acres from pesticide mixing site. So here, we see this a lot now when we look at sites where we have a lot of discrete sample data. You see these some areas of the site, this is zone A, we call it. Every discrete sample exceeds our action level. So the, the random range of concentrations in any given spoonful or pinch of dirt within this area exceeds our action levels. So we're pretty confident that whole area is heavily contaminated. Opposite of that, in area C down here, and this is real data, is all the discrete samples are below our action level. So the range of variability is below our screening level. Pretty confident this area is clean. This, the area that gets you in trouble is this zone B in the middle, where you start seeing these isolated hot spots pop up within an, an area that's contaminated. This is where you're getting in, stuck in the, the random heterogeneity in these artificial hot spots and cold spots. If you went in and dug out these spots, you probably wouldn't change the overall risk within this area at all. If you went back and resampled the site, the same number of discrete samples, you, more hot spots would pop up in areas with beforehand seem clean. So it's a simple problem. Discrete soil samples are just too small to overcome this small scale distributional heterogeneity. It's my favorite cartoons from Gary Larson. He's sitting on the back of an elephant with a microscope and thinking it's a bird. The whole problem is we needed to step back and collect bigger samples. So key point, discrete sample data that we've always been getting, it's only representative reliably of the mass that the laboratory actually tested, and that's a tiny mass. This is probably what soil contamination would look like if you could see it in the field. That's it. part of our work is that everything, in most cases, is invisible. We can't see it. Here's a Jackson Pollock splatter painting here. Imagine here if you were collecting discrete samples within this area, the black stuff was contamination. This red dot is actually the scale of a discrete sample. Now, just move this around, and you'd see the concentration be highly variable within the area. So you'd get really lost trying to characterize this site based on discrete samples. On the right is a truck of spilled milk. So imagine this, you couldn't see the milk, but it spilled across the soil and you're trying to use a few, three or four or five discrete samples with your eyes closed to figure out where the milk is. You'll find some of it, but chances are you're gonna miss a lot of it. This is also probably, if you think about it, what gasoline contamination or PCE or solvent contamination looks like in the subsurface from a leaking tank. This is why we have such trouble characterizing subsurface soils. You get these anastomosing patterns of the migration downward. So our discrete samples from individual cores give really confusing data. You might catch the main mass of it, you might miss a lot. There were a lot of early warnings about these problems with discrete sample data. And Dina Crumling with uh, US EPA headquarters and I looked into a lot of the old documents that she found from the 1980s and 90s. So, so here's a warning from 1992, the same period. Uh, the so-called grab sample or discrete sample is not really a sample, but a specimen of the material that may or may not be representative of the sampling unit. So great care must be exercised <clears throat> when interpreting the meaning of these samples. And if you want to look at this more detail, look at the paper we published in 2017, especially the supplement in part two. 
a lot of really interesting thought going in and you know, questions coming out at this time period. So the, the risk assessors almost got it right, and they're, they're really the ones that we need to get on board. And myself, I'm a geologist and a risk assessor, so for the first 10 years of my career, I was basically giving myself unreliable data to work with, which has caused so much problem with my projects. So imagine this, you have a front yard exposure area, just 20 feet by 20 feet, very small, 400 square feet, four inches deep. But risk assessors knew right away, early on, you couldn't trust a single discrete sample to make a decision, even though the geologists were using that to map out extended contamination. So it can be highly variable within the targeted area. So they realized also very early on, you need to look at the mean or the true concentration to calculate risk or compare to risk-based action levels. So they were on the right track. This is from the early 90s. Ideally, how would a risk assessor do this, do the site investigation, if, if they were the ones in charge? Well, ideally, if you were worried about the risk posed by lead or something in your front yard, you'd excavate the entire yard and send that to the laboratory for testing as a single sample. And you get a single number back from the laboratory, and that would represent the mean concentration of, of PCBs, whatever contaminant it was, in your front yard. So in a risk assessment for chronic risk, we assume that a child would be wandering back and forth, back and forth across this front yard for 350 days a year for 6 to 30 or 24 or 30 years as an adult. So the best sample data we could ever get is test the entire yard. Well, that's not practical in a lot of cases. Well, here's an alternative. This is an alternative that was forced on risk assessors. I would say it wasn't necessarily their choice. So I was forcing it on myself in my early part of my career. Here's an alternative. Let's collect at least 10 discrete samples, and then we're going to test each sample individually, and then we're going to use a statistical test to estimate the mean concentration of the contaminant in that soil, since we can't test it all as one sample. The biggest problem has been in the past that risk assessors are never involved in the sampling design to begin with. They're very rare. And 10-plus samples, a lot of times, are rarely available for a single area. So what do we do is back in the geologists, the people doing the fieldwork side, don't even consult a risk assessor. We know we don't have enough data. We'll just use the maximum. You've seen how variable the data is, how, how useful is that. You may get in the right ballpark. You may find the core contamination, but you could miss a lot of stuff. That's also a high laboratory cost, testing every single discrete sample, which is the reason they don't. But if you, in the early days, and probably still now, how many samples should I collect in my yard or wherever to characterize and test risk? It's not based on risk. Usually you take your, your budget allocated for testing samples and you divide that by the cost of the analytical for testing the sample. That's how many samples you're allowed to collect and you have to make decisions on. So not risk-based. Then the representativeness of the sample set that you happen to get, the estimated mean, you really don't know. Someone go back and collect another set of samples at the same site. Would they get the same mean? We'll look at that in a minute. This is a key lesson I learned from my risk assessor friends. And, or statisticians, is statistical analysis only evaluates the precision of the statistical test employed to estimate a mean for the data provided. It doesn't really tell you anything about the precision, at least reliably, of that data set, that sample set, for the area where it was collected from, or the representativeness of it. Are discrete sample data and the 95% UCLs, are they real? Are they reliable? Something else we looked at in our field study. There's an estimation of mean based on multiple sets of replicate discrete sample data. Again, going back to each one of our grid points, picking a random number. That grid, grid point, in this case, we used 10 different grid points. We did it 20 times, estimated 95% UCLs for each set of, of 10 sample points. So at site A, again, imagine if 10 different people went out and did this. This might be what they get. They get a range of 95% UCL, 403 ppm to 776 p, ppm. It's almost twofold. The relative standard deviation, if you're not familiar with this, anytime this gets above 35%, it's just the variability between individual samples. Then you have to start questioning the reliability of the data. Lead site B, the range of 95% UCLs, 20 iterations to, on 10 sample sets, 201 ppm, 439 ppm, again about twofold. You can see the RSD varies widely between sample sets, but it can be low or it can be high. PCBs, that site was a trip to, to look at. 95% UCLs range from 9.4 ppm to over a million ppm. And look at the RSDs. Any risk assessor seeing this would just throw up their arms and say, what can I do with this data? Well, I'll feed it into pro-UCL, take whatever number it gives me. But they would know in the back of their minds, 
have a lot of concerns about this site and probably request more sample points. So there's another point here, the concentration within a predicted range for 10 randomly picked grid points to estimate a mean. Again, it's, it's random in the end. The estimated mean is, is random within an unknown range. This was a, a shock, I think, to a lot of people. The representativeness of a single 10-point data set is also known, unknown as far as someone else goes back out to the site and collects another independent set where they get the same number. Let's bump it up to 24 grid points. Again, we, at each one of our 24 grid points, we pick a random number from the, for that grid point and calculate a 95% UCL. So do it 20 times. Here's the range we get. See a lot tighter range between the 95% UCLs. See if the arsenic 395 to 492, lead 280 ppm to 394 ppm, PCBs 652 to over 8,000 ppm. RSDs are still kind of high. So again, the the we get a more consistency between the means estimated, especially for site A and B, but consistency doesn't necessarily equal accuracy. And that's the problem. We still don't know if the single 24 sample data set is representative of the area. <clears throat> Here's a better approach. Here's how I think the risk assessors would do it if they could have taken over site investigations back in the 90s. Instead of we're going to still collect soil from lots of points within our targeted area, but instead of testing each one individually, we're going to combine it all into a single sample, a single bulk sample. We're going to have the laboratory thoroughly process this sample, and then we're going to report, they're going to report one concentration. So there's our mean for the sample. We don't need to test every individual bit of soil within this bulk sample. We'll just process it and get one concentration. So you collect a large single sample from multiple points, or increments within a defined decision unit area, and this is what we refer to again as a multi-increment sample. At the laboratory, the sample is carefully processed and subsampled for testing. This replaces the need for statistical analysis of individual discrete samples, an estimation of mean based on a 95% UCL, which if you're still using discretes, you should always do because the mean just for a simple data set is, again, highly unreliable. So now we're just sending one sample to the laboratory instead of 10 or 24. So you save a tremendous amount of money on laboratory costs and a lot of confusion over attempting to use statistical tests to interpret, sometimes uninterpretable, discrete sample data. So now we get back to the question we always have in the field, well, how many increments should this final multi-increment sample include? What's the minimum mass that should be included in the bulk sample, which we never thought about collecting discrete samples? Well, this is something we're not going to go into a lot of detail here. This is G sampling theory for infinite particle media collection of representative soil samples. This is in our training series, part three. But G was, he was in the mining mineral, inter, mineral uh, exploration industry back in the 50s. Uh, based on theoretical considerations and empirical data, he came up with equations, models to, to estimate the mass of soil you need to collect to meet uh, different considerations for heterogeneity and how many increments should be included in each sample. So considerations for representative samples and mass, number of increments, how you actually collect the sample in the field is critical, how the sample is processed and subsampled in the laboratory, and then subsample analysis, just the analytical error, which is your least error in the data you get. We're not going to go into a lot of detail. The bottom line is, for most of the work we do, you need to collect one to two kilograms of soil within a minimum of 50 increments if you're looking at the minus two millimeter particle size and to get PPM data resolution. Now, in some cases, like an arsenic site, you might be able to get away with less increments than that, maybe even 10 or 20, or some people have reported five. You still need to collect that minimum mass, but still, why, why risk it? And you see it's an equation for sample mass. looks at a lot of variables, particle size, density, shape, desired concentration resolution, what's your acceptable total error, fundamental error. So you can calculate all this information. If you really want to know the details of this and sampling theory training courses, Chuck Ramsey teaches an excellent four-day detailed introduction to sampling theory, multi-increment sample site investigation methods. Uh, Francis Batard teaches, a, a, I think, a week or two-week long class for specific for mineral exploration. I like to explain, just keep it simple here, G-sampling theory, explain with a salad. We, this, we do this in our training series part three. So think about this, to keep it simple. And really, this isn't that difficult. We're, I mean, we're collecting a sample of, of dirt from a targeted area. It can't be that complicated once we think about it. So here's, let's assume primary concern here is long-term chronic exposure to tomatoes in my salad. So assume this entire salad you see here is eaten over our lifetime. 
this is my exposure area, exposure volume. Here's the wrong questions to ask, which I asked most of my first 10 years of my career. What's the maximum concentration of tomato in the salad? Well, if I zoom in close enough with a pair of chopsticks and pluck out a piece of tomato, the maximum concentration, if there are tomatoes there, is 100%. Easy question, wrong question. Another wrong question, what's the concentration of tomato at point X in the salad? Well, that's not the question that risk assessors are dealing with. They want to know the mean concentration. Concentration at any given point isn't, isn't important. It needs to be considered in calculating the mean, but it's not the, the objective. So again, the right question is, what is the true or mean concentration of tomato in this salad? So how would I do that? Well, ideally, option one, I just test the entire salad as a single decision unit. So I would just collect a single multi-increment sample from at least 50 points. And if it was soil, one to two kilograms. I'm not sure the mass for a salad. And the one single sample and have the lab test that. They would process it very carefully. They might even puree it and grind it and give me a single number. I'd probably I'd do that three times and collect triplicate samples in, uh, just to compare the, the data from three separate independent tests and check the precision of my sampling method. Chances are a lot of sites we work on, we suspect there's some areas more heavily contaminated than others. If it's the case, then you isolate these areas in your site investigation. Then you collect a single sample within this targeted decision unit areas between the clean and the contaminated. This will help you optimize your remediation. So this is more typical. Again, within the highest contaminated area, we want to be especially sure we get good data for that, that area. And we'll collect triplicate samples. We'll collect the same multi sample three times from three totally different areas, compare the data to test our precision. And this comes in with the experience. We know from experience at our sites, you really do at most sites need to get up close to 50 increments and at least one to two kilogram samples to get reproducible data. It can be less than that other sites. Our PCB site, you need a lot more than that. Laboratory, when the laboratory gets your multi increment salad sample, they're not going to open up the the lid of the bucket or whatever and grab a random pinch or handful of salad and test it. They have to spread it out into a thin layer, then they're going to subsample it very systematically and carefully, the same way you collected the sample in the field from 30 or 40 or 50 points. And then they're going to test that subsample, which in this now would be representative of the sample that was submitted. They're going to do this three times to check the precision. Now, soil samples, the same thing for non-volatile chemicals. There's a whole other method to use for volatile chemicals. You're gonna, the laboratory is going to air dry the sample, sieve it down to the target particle size, collect a subsample from 30 to 50 points, minimum 10 gram mass. This is all through G sampling theory, minimum mass based on fundamental errors and other issues. For less than 2 millimeters of soil is 10 grams, not 1 gram for metals. Then they'll collect rep, laboratory replicates to test their subsampling precision. You know, labs have been recommending this for decades, but it's never been pushed by regulators. And, and it's also an added cost, so they're not going to do it for free. So now your sample is representative of where you collected it. Now your laboratory data representative of the sample submitted. We collected multi income samples at the, all the study sites, three study sites that we uh, carried out our investigation of discrete sampling variability on. Each one of these sites, and these are small areas between 5,000 square feet and about 15,000 square feet. We collected triplicate 50 to 60 multi increment samples in a grid-like fashion across each one of the sites. Each of our samples, one to two kilograms. Some of our sites, and I'm actually working with some, in, uh, some other colleagues in China right now, they like big samples, and they completely get multi increment samples. Uh, most of them have PhDs in soil science. They, like, they want three or four kilogram samples or even bigger. Each one of our study sites, minimum one to two kilogram samples, process subsampled in accordance with G sampling theory at the laboratory like I discussed. Here's what we got there. The study site A, the average concentration of the triplicate multi samples, three samples tested, 233 ppm. Look at the relative standard deviation, 6.5%. So risk assessors, you can take this to the bank as you say. That's, that's very good data, great precision. The lead contaminated site, average of the triplicate samples, 287 ppm. RSD 20%. Again, you know, very good precision. One point I'd point out here for the MI samples, we were using method 6010 at the laboratory to test for metals, extraction methods. For the discrete samples, we're using XRF. You can't really compare the concentrations, just to point that out. Look at our PCB site, average concentration of the triplicate samples, 104 ppm. 
But look at the RSD, 138%. So we tested our three triplicate samples for the PCB site. First sample came back 24 ppm. Second sample came back 19 ppm. So we thought, wow, we nailed a PCB site finally. The third site came back 249 ppm. So we never would have known that, that our sample data even the means for a single MI sample were unreliable if we had only collected and tested one sample, or if we'd only collected one suite of discrete samples and gotten a mean. You only know this by collecting replicate multi increment samples. So you see the relative standard deviations uh, interpretation we use at the bottom in our office. Up to 50% relative standard deviation will still accept the data. We want you to discuss how you can improve your sampling method or what went wrong in, usually in the field. We incorporate that in our laboratory into our guidance. Once you get a RSD over 50% to 100%, you're starting to get in poor precision. We recommend using 95% UCL, you know, adjusting your data for this for all the, your MI data, including in DUs where you didn't collect discrete or multi sample replicates. Over 100%, like we saw at the PPC, PCB site, you probably need to go out and retest the site. You can take another consideration to your target concentration and such. That's probably the case. So looking at sample support here, this is a great term here. It's, you know, what what mass of soil does your sample data actually represent? Our same study sites here, discrete sample data, remember we have 24 grid points each site. But for the metal data, our, our discrete sample data, one sample at each grid point, only represented a gram for each sample, 24 grams, about what an XRF or laboratory would test. That's a, a spoonful of dirt. PCB site, maybe 240 grams, a small handful. And we, the laboratory charged us for 24 analysis, so very low sample support. Our multi increment sample data, looking at the triplicates, we tested 180 points within each targeted area. Mass of soil representative represented over four kilograms. We only had three samples tested by the laboratory. So multi increment sample data provide far more better support. So now this gets to the point that that's really it for a multi increment sampling decision. It's, we'll look at a few more details in a minute. But, but. Uh, our question always comes up, are discrete sample data ever useful? And the question we always ask ourselves, those of us have been doing this for years, you mean I wasted my time for the last 10, 20, 30 years? Well, not really. Uh, discrete sample data are still good for initial identification of contaminants of concern, initial estimation of risk. They're useful for you know, initial removal of large areas of contamination. You see in this example here, too, back to our arsenic-contaminated site, this was nine acres. We were lost here collecting MI samples in 5,000 square foot DU areas. Everything was coming up contaminated. So in this case, the consultant went in with a, put in 90 points, collected really good discrete samples, tested with an XRF, and highlighted this heavily contaminated area. We already know this is heavily contaminated. Why even bother testing it? Just dig it up and do confirmation samples. So you'll find the core amount of contamination with discrete samples. You'll just get lost where it starts getting highly variable, which could be the whole site. So discrete samples are good for designating DUs uh, for final uh, confirmation collecting MI samples. But again, you always want to confirm with multi increment sample data. What about acute risk? And this is a separate topic, but this has come up. And, you know, another reason why I want to collect discrete samples, I want to look for acute risk. Let's think about this in more detail. Go back to our front yard, 400 square feet. We're looking at soil in the upper four inches. So. Here's the potential hypothetical question. Does the concentration of contaminant X in any potential discrete soil sample collected from the yard exceed concentration Y or acute based on hypothetical acute toxicity? Well, think about this in more detail. What's the total mass of soil in the front yard here? About 1. 1,800 kilograms, a lot of soil. What's the mass of a typical discrete sample? About 100 grams. For testing for metals, what's the laboratory aliquot mass? About a gram. So in the end, this is an unanswerable question in terms of fuel cost and liability. How many, let's just look at the one gram aliquot. They're one point, they're, they're 1 1.8 million potential one gram samples within this front yard. How many samples, individual samples do you need to test to confirm with any confidence that no single gram of soil exceeds your hypothetical acute toxicity factors? It would be a, a lot. But we're not really concerned about laboratory aliquot. We're concerned about kids eating dirt. We assume they're only ingesting 200 milligram pinches of dirt each day. So now we're up to 9 million potential 200 milligram samples to test within this front yard. Maybe you just want to focus on pica kids where they're eating 10 grams of soil at any one time. 
worried about acute risk there. Well, now we're, there are 180,000 potential 10-gram samples to test in this front yard. You're not going to catch that or with any confidence testing 10 or 20 or 30 individual discrete samples in if they lab tested 10 grams. At a minimum, you might test 59 samples where, you, in theory, you could attain 95% confidence that 95% of the untested 10-gram masses don't exceed the maximum concentration identified in these 59. But nobody's going to test 59 samples in exposure. It's very rare. So in the end, testing for acute risk with any reasonable degree of uncertainty is, isn't practical at all in soil. And they also, more importantly, acute toxicity factors aren't even available for most of the chemicals we look at. If they are, they're usually for volatiles and just for inhalation. So if you really have a potential concern with acute risk at a site, then the best thing you could do is uh, remove or cap the suspect soil. So in the end, it's all about decision units. And we'll, we'll end with this, just a few quick examples. It's, again, we training series part one and two, we go into a lot of detail about how to split sites up into decision units for exposure areas, for risk, or optimize remediation. Again, a DU is the area and volume of soil you'd send to the laboratory, single sample if you could. You usually can't, so you have to collect a representative sample. Key point is you want to set your decision unit size equal to what you need to make decisions in the field, so you're not going back and back and back at the site collecting more samples. And the good news here is this is what we've always been doing in the field. You want to tr typically try to identify what you think are suspect spill areas or heavily contaminated areas. You draw a line that. There's your decision unit. You may break it up into smaller areas. Risk assessors want to know about exposure area to use, front yards or large areas for commercial sites or entire parks. Site When you're doing site remediation, you especially want to Folk isolate the areas of contamination. We talk about boundary DUs, as they call it in an ITRC document. I actually like that term better. We use the term perimeter DUs. It's where you're, you're using small DUs, trying to isolate contamination, optimize remediation, not waste time disposing of clean soil or treating it. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about that. A lot of details on the field collection of samples. How do you prepare a site initially for sample collection, marking your decision units, collecting soil in gravelly areas versus fine grain areas. We have all that in our guidance from about 10 years of experience, training series part four. How to test surface soils. How do you test subsurface soils? How do you use this at UST sites or leaking tank sites? What if I can only put in a single boring? What, how can I improve the data, at least from a single boring? We talk about single borehole decision units just for exploratory concerns like we've always done before. You can't necessarily use it for final decision making, but you can get some information. We talk about Testing excavation, stockpile, sediment, VOCs, equipment decontamination, a lot of information. So I want to end with this case study. It's hypothetical. Once you get the, the problems with discrete samples, the big issue is where do you start, and especially in how do you split up a site. Something especially started using on some of the just huge sites that uh, we're working on in, in China, acres, 50 acres. This is all hypothetical in this particular case, big industrial complex. Where do you start? Here's the best way to start. Start with one DU. I'm going to draw a line around this entire site and test it as a single DU, and I'm going to collect one sample. That's generally not going to be acceptable for remediation purposes or for risk or anything. It's just too large. Maybe it is in some cases. Probably not. So what you have to do is progressively start dividing up your site into smaller and smaller DUs until everybody's happy, your risk assessors, your remediation people, the people just trying to map out contamination. Here's what we might do at this site. Now we split it up into three different areas where they had industrial operations from factories, have an office, an area where they were just office buildings, and we have all these different neighborhoods of residential homes. The question might be, are the individual past-use areas uh, as a whole impacted above screening levels? This might be okay for the commercial area. Maybe there's no reason to think it's contaminated. You wouldn't even test it in the first place. We'll go ahead and test it as a single exposure area to you just to make sure you still got to split up your industrial operation areas and your residential areas into smaller places. So here's the next step. So in this case, we've identified five different factory areas and four different uh, neighborhood areas based on the times that these places were built. So the question now is, are the individual neighborhoods and factory areas impacted above screening levels? This is probably still too large to satisfy the risk assessors based on exposure areas. And also, you know, these factory areas are heavily contaminated, so you can't just treat them as a single area for sampling. Let's look at the housing areas first. The question might be, were tomato sides or lead-based paint used at the work or housing buildings or under these individual houses? If that's your question, you might just test a fraction of the buildings within each one of these different neighborhoods, built at different times. They might 
Maybe they use pesticides, lead-based paint, maybe not. So this will tell you if, if, if you find these lead or pesticides at you know, a fraction of the houses in the neighborhood, you might just declare the whole neighborhood contaminated. Don't even bother testing, just manage the soil properly during redevelopment. I feel probably not good enough for the risk assessors. If you like, say you excavate all the soil from this site or you didn't think you found anything, next case talk to your risk assessors. They might, even the regulators, they might designate half acre exposure area to you. So you split your entire neighborhood areas up in a half acre exposure area decision. It's, you're going to collect a single multi increment sample on each one. Replicates in 10% of the, of the DUs. In this case, there are 36 total. You collect replicates each one of the neighborhoods. This will satisfy the, the risk assessors. And ending with a factory site here. This, some of the factory sites are going to be really complicated. You know you've got contamination. You want to control your costs. You want to get in and get out. So do a, a very thorough investigation. So in this case, you designate decision. It's based on past spill areas, tanks, dump sites, storage areas, assumed clean areas and such. So small DUs used to isolate contaminated soil. Again, optimize remediation. Maximum DU size, talk to your risk assessors. The default, they want a half acre minimum exposure area resolution for the site. So that's your maximum DU size, even if you think it's clean. In the end, agree with, this might be agreed with the agencies. You do concurrent testing of surface and subsurface soils. You can actually collect your confirmation samples before you go in and do excavation and treatment. Again, collecting MI samples in each one of these areas as needed. And then data used to prepare the final remediation plan. So in this case, you get in and you get out much faster. You may have to go in and retest a couple of times, but this is a clear endpoint site. So that's it. This is actually a site we worked on confirmation samples after excavating. Then we collected 100 multi-increment samples at this site. It took four or five days, but we got in, we got out, and we were done at it. That's a key point to this with very reliable data. You can do this for large agricultural fields. I wouldn't, I'm not going to go into detail on this. We, here we redeveloping large ag fields for residential use. First step, split your field up into lots of really big DUs based on past use, crops, pesticides, drainages, and such. Test each one just to quickly screen a field area. If you find really high levels of pesticide as a whole, you may want to drop consideration for redeveloping the area. If you actually want to continue with redevelopment, in our guidance, you have to test minimum of 59 random one acre decision it's within that area to clear it for residential reuse. So the question may come up, would you test my yard? No, but we tested a, your neighborhood in a random number of lots. So I'll finish up here with Hawaii's transition from discretes to DUMIS. And we started this in 2004, 2005. Over a four-year period for completed projects, they're already done. We don't go back and test completed projects. In most cases, we did the best we could. We took out the core contamination. We wasted a lot of time and money trying to map this out. In some cases, we may have left some stuff behind. At least we think we got the worst. Currently active projects during this time period, we published our first guidance in 2009. Existing discrete data can be used for initial remedial actions where you know you have contamination, but we always we start requiring DUMIS data for confirmation. And you see a lot of surprises. We consistently get surprised. Where we think an area is clean and we go in and do better sampling and find contamination. All new projects now in Hawaii, really since 2009, discrete sample data can be used for initial screening. We do this on purpose even, especially for metal sites with the field XRF. But DUMIS data is usually norm, normally used to complete an investigation and for final remediation designs. It's always required for confirmation. So that's it. I know that was a lot of information, but that's a, sort of history of the last 25 years, DUMIS in a nutshell. So a key point here, and this is getting back to the ISM document, we published ITRC in 2012. The idea is that, that really the wrong question is, is when are DUMIS methods or ISM methods applicable to the site? That's not the question that came up. The right question you need to start thinking about, knowing what we know now with all the variability and reliability, when are discrete sampling methods and discrete soil sample data still acceptable for final decision making? So we like to say DUMIS or ISM is not just another tool in the toolbox. It's an entirely new and improved set of tools. So with that, we'll take any questions. I know it's, it's been an hour, but we'll stick around as long as possible. Again, this webinar will be recorded and posted to our web page, and we'll send a notice out to everyone. Okay, Roger. So, Sorry. Yeah. No, no, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, we have a couple questions that came in. Um, the first question would be, can you please ask 
the speaker to re-summarize the main differences between composite sampling and MI sampling. Okay, let's do that. Now this, you know, personally, and I know some of my sampling theory friends would, wouldn't be happy, but I don't have a huge problem with the term composite. We've used that. It's, it's kind of a field slang among geologists. But the problem is dealing with regulation regulators who aren't familiar with this in regular specific requirements like in Tosca. So it, in this here's a composited sample for discrete samples. Again, this, as it's written in Tosca, it's an individual discrete samples intended to represent a specific area of a site where a different decision would be is going to be made. Like does this area where I collected this single discrete sample is it contaminated above levels of concern, say from risk. I don't want to pay for testing all these samples, so I combine them into one single sample for testing at the laboratory. So I'm compositing the samples. Now I have a composite sample as defined under TOSCA. But, but the problem is I could have had higher, say, PCB concentrations in DU4 in this slide. So I'm, I'm diluting the concentration or unrepresenting this area. So under TOSCA and other RICRA regulations, I have to multiply my laboratory results by the number of discrete samples included in the composite. What they really mean is you have to multiply your laboratory results by the number of areas represented by those discrete samples or independent decisions we've made. That's the way the term composite is used in some regulations. Other EPA guidance, composite is used in the exact same way as we use multi increment samples. All we really do is add more science-based using G sampling theory uh, issue to it. Um, here's the mass of soil you need to test to account for distributional heterogeneity composite compositional heterogeneity and such, fundamental error. Here's the number of air you need to collect it from. So in a slang way, you can think of MI samples as really good composite samples. But that's going to get you, in, as some of the EPA people online now can testify to, get us in a lot of trouble with some regulators, RICA regulations. So composite, a composite multi-increment sample is where you would take several multi-increment samples and combine them into one single sample for testing. That's a composite multi-increment sample which you would never do after spending all this time in the field. Okay, I think we I have, yeah, I think we have one more question that came in. Well, two more, excuse me. So the next one is, risk assessors often use the 95% UCL on the mean to account for uncertainty in exposure point concentrations. You seem to suggest that MIS is sufficient to address uncertainty and that 95% UCLs are not needed. Could you comment on this? It seems to me that if MIS is done and that there is variability, that 95% UCLs should be used even for MIS samples. This would mean, this would be particularly true if the concentration difference between the mean and the 95% UCL was associated with significant risk. For example, HQ of 10 or cancer risk of one in 100,000. Okay. Okay, so let's go back to this slide. Here, this is where some geologists like me has gone out to a site and collected a bunch of discrete samples, and the numbers are highly variable. So you, you want a, the risk assessor, which could be me on the other side, that uh, needs to estimate a mean. So in this case, all they can do with the data you, you provided them is, is use some statistical tests to estimate a mean concentration of the contaminant uh, for those samples that you tested. Now, what are some of the problems with that is the, the mass of soil represented by these individual discrete samples could be minute. In this case, say we had 24 discrete soil samples tested for lead, where they're only testing one gram, where well, the mass of soil represented by those 24 grams of soil is, is way, way below what's really needed under sampling theory to represent that soil. So that's the biggest problem with using discrete sample data, 95% UCLs, to estimate risk, is that it doesn't comply with sampling theory. So they realized this early on in, when they were exploring for gold, was that collecting discrete samples and estimating means wasn't working. They go out to a site, uh, collect a bunch of discrete samples, test them, estimate the mean concentration of gold, and then they go out and mine the gold, and there's nothing there. The, the mean concentration way overestimated what was there or way underestimated what was there, and they just abandon the site thinking there's nothing there. And that was the problem with the data. So the whole idea of G sampling theory was to replace the the use of statistical tests with discrete soil samples. And it was that was a key point in the the mining mineral exploration industry. So it, 
in that that case, looking at the variability between individual points, it, it doesn't work using discrete sample uh, tests because the the mass of soil is representative, and you may not have enough increments or points the, the, to estimate a mean on realistically. That's where G sampling theory comes into play. I don't know if I answered that clearly, but we also discussed this in part three of our of our guidance. So the, the main point is that the the, mon, the mineral exploration people and the agriculture people, farm people looking for nutrient concentrations in field realized early on 10, 20, 30, 50 years ago that estimating mean concentrations for soil based on what you call population statistics, discrete samples, didn't work. So PRG figured out why, because you have to take into account all these other factors, particle size, density, shape of the particles even, fundamental error and such. And, and through theory and empirical data, realize that this approach is much more reliable for estimating means. So I think we, we should have, have a I'm sorry, one Rob. thing on this. I think at some point we need to have a separate webinar for risk assessors, DUMIS and discrete for risk assessors. Let's plan on that maybe later on this year, even write a paper on it. Okay. Okay, so the next question would be, um, what if your DU is 10 feet deep? How do you rationalize the sampling increments? Yeah, so we have a whole section on subsurface a collection of uh, MI samples subsurface. So if your if your DU is 10 feet deep, let's just say it is 10 feet deep. Maybe it's 50 feet by 50 feet by 10 feet, whatever that comes out to. So if you want to collect a multi-increment sample within there, a, a key thing to get the most representative data is each point needs to be separated by the same distance in a, a grid-like fashion. So some people actually use VPS, if you've heard of it, to figure out how to space increments. I, think, I don't know if you can do it within three dimensions or not. But if that's your if that's your DU, then you have to go in borings and collect equally spaced increments within that area and figure it out. And it's, you might think putting 30 borings in is, is going to be real expensive, take a lot of time, but consultants in Hawaii have been doing that routinely now for almost 10 years. So you can figure out ways to do this more efficiently. It may be more difficult to do it in in place, maybe the easiest thing to do is just dig it up and put it in a stockpile, spread it out, and collect your samples that way. Okay, so the next question would be, um, many at the EPA consider that the HRS forbids MIS or composite samples for purposes of scoring. Do you have opinions on this? Yeah, I agree. Composite samples shouldn't be used for scoring, but the and multi increment samples and ISM samples are not composite samples under those regulations that we're talking about, because it's just a sample is all it is collected from a single area. Think about if you went to the grocery store and you see a bunch of apples and you wonder what's the pesticide concentration of pesticide in these apples, but you go up and grab a single apple, that's a discrete sample. Well, that's not going to be representative of all those apples. Say they're all grown at the same time from the same place. You go up and collect. 10 apples or 30 apples from that same pile, that's still, it's a sample. It's a multi-increment sample. It's not a composite sample. You take all these 30 apples, send them to the lab, they grind them up and test for pesticides. That's why I don't like using the term composite, it, because it, it complicates things with some of the regulations written in the past. If the question should be, should we rely on, still rely on discrete samples for HRS scoring? That's really where you need to start. Okay, so the next question is, G's theory for FSE shows one to two kilogram samples are required to control variability of particles um, less than two millimeters to acceptable levels. Slide 47 shows a 10 gram sample to be sufficient mass for a lab subsample. What about particle size reduction on slide 47? That's a good idea. 47, and I won't, I won't get into detail on this, but the, the the best thing to do, I'd say take Chuck's class or read G's book, the 10 grams is under the most ideal circumstances, the, the minimum mass you would ever be able to collect of soil for less than two millimeter samples. And this is really only applicable if you process a sample, air dried it, sieved it and such, and carefully subsampled it. You actually, if, if you're looking at the fine particle size, say less than 250 microns or even 100 micron fraction, and according to G sampling theory, you can 
get away with testing one gram or even less than one gram of, of soil. But in, in reality, and the Army Corps of Engineers has been doing this for 20 years, you can't get representative data once you get down to that small. Maybe if they would, the, the Army Corps of Engineers, when they're testing for metals or explosives especially, they want to grind everything. And once you grind it, then you'll get much more reproducible data. And you can get away with testing these small masses. 10 grams, I'm shocked personally that you can get a representative data testing 10 grams of soil, even if it's from a front yard only 20 feet by 20 feet. But we actually are able to do it once we get our bulk sample size in the field up to one or two kilograms and from at least 50 increments for typical contaminants like lead and such. So G sampling theory, like science actually works. But the whole grinding thing is an issue we talk about it in our webinars and in our lab manual. I think from a risk assessment standpoint, we usually don't want to grind the samples because you increase the bioavailability of the sample. It's not, the data you get is not necessarily representative of the bioavailable fraction of contaminants in the soil, but that's a whole another issue to deal with. In some cases, we do want to grind it, like where you think you have lead-based paint, you're concerned about that or something. In other cases, you don't. Okay, the last question we have is, can you please clarify the differences between the ITRC ISM and your DUMIS? Well, so in, in theory, there is no difference because they're both based on, it's supposed to be based on G sampling theory. I think the main difference now is with the ITRC ISM document, it was really a work in progress. And you know now we've got 10 years more experience in the field and they're, a lot of the discussion in the ITRC document, we were still debating discrete soil sample data. There it was still kind of seen as the gold standard by a lot of the people involved, probably still now. So you'll see a lot of that in the 2012 ITRC document, trying to compare MIS data to discrete sample data. And there's some statistical tests used on an artificial computer database with discrete sample points, trying to evaluate the, the reliability of multi sample data which really isn't applicable at all now. That's the, exactly what PRG was trying to get away from, is using individual points to estimate mean concentrations for soil, since we know it, it just doesn't work for what he called infinite particle media. So there's, there's some really good stuff in the ITRC document. It's, it was short on actually how to implement this in the field. I think that's where Hawaii's guidance really comes into, into play, how to get out and do this. And then, <clears throat> In a lot of field experience, built in how do you collect a sample, what tools do you use, what shape should your individual increments be, are included in, in Hawaii's guidance, the DUMIS guidance. And a lot of case studies included on how to designate DUs. That's really what it comes down to. That uh, This stuff, will, information will hopefully be, hopefully be incorporated into the update the ITRC document that a large group are working on now. Okay, and that, that was our last question for you, Roger. Okay, so that's, that's a great place to stop. Is this, they updated the ITRC document, a big group working on it now. You know, a lot of them are new to this. So, you know, bring in your ideas and question everything. That's how we got started with our work. I mean, question the ITRC's ISM document, or, you know, why collect ISM samples, MI samples, just to force yourself to think about it more. Go out in the field. The best way to understand this is to get out in the field. I think that's why Hawaii started doing this 10 years ago. We have our own field team where every year we go out and test abandoned properties. And we were getting really confused with discrete sample data. And we got great grant money from US EPA. We started doing our, our test for discrete samples. So we collect our own samples. Get the risk assessors out in the field collecting samples. And once they see how discrete samples were being collected on my geologist side, I'd freak out if I were them. Like, really, you want me to make a decision on this? But We've taken risk assessments out in the field with us, and once you start collecting these MI samples, and that's it's, it's really the gold standard as far as reliability and long-term liability in the data you're getting. So that add in, and thanks for for joining in. You've got my email address on the front slide, and we'll post the any final updates to our web page for the presentation and recorded webinar on the web page. I always love to get emails, chat about anonymous sites, and so we can keep building on the guidance we have now. So with that, I'll end in uh, mahalo, and thanks, everyone, for joining in and looking forward to talking to you in the future. And any ideas on future webinars would be much appreciated. I think 
UST sites and more information for risk assessments would be great. So thanks a lot. Have a great day.